Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome Jeff Bizard, um, who um, I'm very proud of because <laughs> sorry, he was my first PhD student to finish uh, and, and pass with flying colours. Um, yeah, a very good uh, complimentary comment for his examiners. Um, yes, um, and Jeff did some very interesting work on language attitudes um, in the Tibetan Dharamsala, Dharamsala diaspora. Um, um, which is the main centre in India, and you'll explain this, I guess, where, where people from Tibet have, have yeah. gone in exile, and the language practices and attitudes that they have in, in that context. Using a variety of methods, which some of you might be interested in, I know some of you are interested in that. Yes. Um, when I asked Jeff for some biodata, um, he said to me, is it this? You can tell them I'm currently a housewife in East London. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. um, Yes, I'm hoping to submit some article, articles for publication this year based on part of the thesis, which I would strongly, strongly recommend. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes, and I think, is it you? you you're, yeah, anyway. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jeff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, if I get a bit quiet, tell me, please. Or we'll take it from there. So. <laughs> As Julia said, I'd like to talk to you about uh, language attitudes and identity in the Tibetan Dharamsala diaspora, or more uh, precisely, language attitudes, identities, and linguistic varieties in the Dharamsala diaspora. Uh, my research looks at the association between these three parts, um, and I will claim that the uh, salient aspects of my findings are valid representations of the Tibetan Dharamsala diaspora. I can make such claims, um, I will argue, because uh, the subject matter is a salient feature for the uh, Tibetans living in uh, Dharamsala. I've got quite a lot to get through, so I might skip some tables at the end, because I've got, yeah, mm, anyway, here we go. So, um, in terms of some background information, uh, uh, this is Tibet, uh, approximately according to what the authorities in uh, Dharamsala would equate to. Um, it's uh, 2.5 million uh, kilometres squared in size. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the salient um, identity constructs. So this is quite useful to show you that there's something called the, the Chukusum uh, 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 three main provinces of Tibet. So I'm going to, in terms of vocabulary, I'm going to be talking about um, Udzang and Amdal and Kham a lot. And Udzang is the, uh, the main region on the plateau. Uh, Amdal is kind of this guy up here, and Kham is uh, like here. And so um, the Tibetan Thomas region essentially is uh, mostly Udzang, for example, and Lhasa is in Udzang. Um, in terms of other vocabulary, it's going to be worth mentioning at this stage. I'm also going to talk about Sanjos and Shijaks. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Shijaks are, Shijak is the Tibetan word for settlement, and um, in the Tibetan diaspora, uh, those born in, in India or might often refer to themselves or um, be labelled with the Shijak uh, identity construct. And Sanjos, which is new arrivals, are uh, those that come from uh, the Tibetan regions in the PRC, the People's Republic of China, that come into the diaspora. And it's worth mentioning, I can't quite say it, that's Dharamsala there. So, um, okay, so that's some of the major vocabulary. Uh, also, I'm gonna be talking about uh, three, I might be talking about three abbreviations quite a lot. So, instead of uh, Tibetan Dharamsala Sala diaspora, I'm going to say uh, TDDD, TDD, Tibetan Downside Diaspora. And then um, there's the PRC, which I mentioned, and the CTA, which is the Central uh, Tibetan Administration, uh, which was previously called the, um, uh, the Government in Exile. Right, so um, to sum up the history as briefly as I can, uh, if we look at the last 100 years, um, in 1913, uh, uh, Tibet claimed its independence, or its de facto independence, as it's sometimes referred to. By 1950, the People's Liberation Army invaded uh, Tibet, and um, there was a sort of joint share of power on the surface, or you could argue that the, the 
the existing Lhasa government was a, was a puppet state of the Chinese until 1959, where you had the Tibetan uprising, and then the Dalai Lama uh, went into exile. Uh, more recently, uh, it's probably just worth pointing out um, that a salient, a salient aspect of the history could be uh, viewed in terms of the protests, especially in the late uh, 80s, and the protests around 2008 to do with the Olympics in Beijing, and uh, the self-immolations that were committed by Tibetans as a form of protest. Okay, so to talk about the uh, Tibetan Dharamsala, uh, the TDD. Um, Tibetans began residing in Dharamsala in 1960. Uh, it's viewed as the, uh, the capital in exile or the hub of uh, the Tibetan diaspora. <coughs> um, 127,000 Tibetans reside uh, outside the Tibetan areas of the PRC, and that's approximately 3% of the Tibetan population as a whole. According to the uh, demographic survey of uh, Tibetans in exile produced by the Planning Commission of the CTA in 2009, uh, 94,000 uh, Tibetans were living in India across 41 settlements uh, with uh, just under 14,000 living in the scattered settlement of uh, Dharamsala. Okay, so 70% of Tibetan refugees in South Asia belong uh, to the former provinces of Udzang and Ngari. Um, we're just gonna, I'm just going to talk about Udzang. So 70% uh, belongs to Udzang, 25% to uh, Kam, and 5 to the Andal province, <coughs> according to Rubio. Um, Dharamsala is uh, a place that Tibetans view as one that facilitates uh, the opportunity to go abroad. Um, so uh, this adds to sort of um, the notion of the, the transient aspect of, of living in the diaspora. Uh, 3,220 Tibetans living in Dharamsala stated that they intended to migrate. Uh, a second salient issue regarding the transient uh, population is that uh, approximately half or slightly over half of the Tibetans that came into exile uh, from uh, the Tibetan regions in the PLC um, have gone back. Uh, this is due to uh, temporary visas, an end of their education or a lack of opportunities to, for them to subsist. Um, according to Rubio, again in uh, 2004, uh, those that returned to Tibet uh, are ostracized and persecuted by the Chinese authorities. Uh, Tibetans born in India also feel the constraints of uh, living in the diaspora due to uh, questions about rights and like, land ownership and such like. Um, okay, so um, just to talk about the language briefly. Um, uh, Tibet belongs to the Bodic branch of Tibetan Burman. Uh, a salient aspect of it are the multiple varieties within Tibetan. Uh, Tanaj recognizes uh, 220 Tibetan dialects spoken by approximately uh, 6 million people. Uh, one of the defining aspects of the linguistic boundaries of these dialects or varieties is the mutual unintelligibility. The foremost distinction between the varieties of um, the Tibetan language are phonological, lexical, and uh, uh, syntactical. And 80% uh, of the Tibetan population in the PRC are a marginalized group of rural uh, peasants and nomads. And so they're generally considered to be uh, monolingual. <coughs> um, Kipuri, in 2009, identifies assimilation policies as a deliberate attempt to deny uh, indigenous groups their own identity and cultures and cause uh, indigenous varieties to die out. So, uh, as Tanaja states, um, Tibetan in all its forms must be regarded as an endangered language, condemned to an irreversible decline, if not outright extinction within two generations, if the present linguistic policies in the PRC continue. Um, it's worth noting that that was in 2003, so maybe that's not quite the case. Um, in the diaspora culture, uh, ooh, sorry, uh, the Dalai Lama uh, claims that the, the diaspora culture is a lot uh, more purer than the uh, Tibetan culture inside Tibet. Um, oh, where am I? Uh, 
One of the major, or one of the salient features of this diasporic culture, though, is something which Anand calls the diasporic culture of preservation. <coughs> so there's um, uh, a need to protect, protect uh, traditions and, and the Tibetan culture, all things Tibetan. Um, however, Yangdong Dundrup uh, criticizes this cultural conservatism, saying that this has led to uh, uh, the culture being ossified or um, there's periods of inertia. And Clifford uh, describes this as forming um, acts of impurity within the own Tibetan uh, culture itself. Um, there's reason, though, for them to want to have a sort of salvage mentality of their culture. Um, the CTA claim that uh, 7.5 million Han Chinese live in what used to constitute uh, Tibet, while the Tibetan population remains at 6 million. Um, Sering Shakya argues that uh, the Tibet issue, though, has no political expediency um, and uses uh, um, Palestine as a comparison. Okay, um, so <coughs> continuing the idea about uh, the diasporic culture of uh, Tibet, it's um, often bombarded with uh, notions of um, uh, Orientalism or, or uh, stereotyping, or, or it's often romanticized. So um, Rubio uh, refers to this as the mythos of Tibet, and Anand calls it uh, Tibetan exotica. So, for example, um, Peace and non-violent descriptions of Tibetans originating from the diaspora are uh, politicized notions of Tibetan culture and identity that are unprecedented and distinctly modern um, and are a reaction to exile as, a, <coughs> as opposed to colonization. Um, so, so that's an example of how they're politicized. But then Anand will also, uh, Anand will says, uh, or asserts that um, Tibetans are labelled with the, the victim of Chinese brutality or Western exoticism. So uh, uh, this, this victimisation paradigm is one that he argues um, depreciates the idea of Tibetan agency in the diaspora and um, uh, depoliticizes their uh, culture, the diasporic culture. So, so you have a an ebb and flow between them being accused of not being political and, and their political ambitions or whatever being depolitical. Um, okay, so what this research is going to investigate, uh, what I'm going to show, are the uh, linguistic uh, repertoires and speech practices of the members of the TDD, the language attitudes and the identity constructions. Uh, the data for this research was collected over a period of a year uh, in the TD in the TDD. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and it combines uh, quantitative and qualitative research uh, instruments. The results for these uh, three data collection oh, I use three data co collection techniques, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the, the data from those were triangulated, and they facilitated comparisons, correlations, and contextualization. Uh, the research incorporates an interpretive perspective in conjunction with a strong motivation uh, to use informant descriptions uh, of linguistic and cultural items. So, um, okay, no, I'll explain it later. Right, so to talk a little bit about language attitudes, um, in the most basic concept, uh, an attitude can be defined as a disposition to respond favourably or unfavourably towards an object, a person, or um, an institution or event. Uh, however, um, uh, this doesn't discount the idea that you can have numerous interpretations of a particular event or person, etc. Uh, attitudes are defined as latent hypothetical characteristics or uh, psychological constructs uh, where direct observation is uh, unachievable. However, Gunther et al. 2009 argues that mental and emotional phenomena are no less real than uh, uh, physical behaviour. Uh, so, language attitudes are also considered to be an integral part of communicative competence. Uh, the major implication, therefore, is that uh, speakers are capable of making linguistic choices uh, with each choice having different consequences in terms of perception for the listener uh, as well as the speaker. And um, then finally, uh, Lambert uh, 
talks about uh, the three components of uh, language attitude being cognitive, affective, and cognitive. Um, a major, uh, the major dimensions along uh, which views about language vary in social uh, psychology in, among, uh, within the social psychology framework are social status and group solidarity. Uh, social distinctions between a standard and non-standard uh, linguistic variety reflect a relative social status or social power with language vitality attributed to the value of solidarity. In-group solidarity or language loyalty uh, reflect the social pressures to maintain a linguistic variety, even uh, one without prestige, or one with covert prestige. Um, Colmus argues that a diasporic uh, situation, uh, that in a diasporic situation, uh, uh, symbolic value or, or hyperization of value can be attributed to heritage uh, varieties. Um, however, migrant varieties face extinction within generations, according to Chambers, unless extraordinary, <coughs> unless extraordinary initiatives are taken. Uh, and oh, it's okay. All right. So, to end, um, I'd also like to talk about uh, a cat. Oh well, no, I can just so. Um, uh, oh, however, oh no, that's, interlocutors uh, can exaggerate linguistic features uh, to cause diversity among linguistic varieties, uh, as well as the, um, converging in acts of accommodation. And this is in the, 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 the cat theory. So does that make sense? So there's, uh, uh, interlocutors can, can pronounce the differences in their linguistic varieties to, to show their identity or their language loyalty, or they can uh, uh, accommodate other linguistic varieties in acts of um, convergence. Right, so uh, these are my research questions, which I've kind of really gone over already. So it's looking at the linguistic varieties, the intelligibility reported among uh, Tibetic variety speakers, <coughs> and uh, the identity constructs as well as uh, the attitudinal aspect which reports on to see whether there's a paradoxical situation where prestige and stigma traits uh, are uh, uh, both reported. So whether uh, um, uh, a member of the TDD will react both favorably and unfavorably towards another Tibetic variety. It's possibly worth... So I've talked about the Chukasun regions, the Udzang, Kham and Amdo. Um, you have within these regions uh, multiple varieties associated to that identity construct, so which I'm talking about in terms of Tibetic varieties. So uh, you will have uh, uh, Amdal varieties, Kham varieties, and Udzang varieties. Um, so they're called, it's called in Tibetan, it's K, uh, so Udzang K. If I say that, you'll know. So Udzang K or Amdal K or, or such like. Um, That's the. Sorry, I don't know where I am. Right, oh, I've done that twice now. So, um, just to go back to the intelligibility aspect, um, one of the main things I wanted to look at with regard to that was a, a polynomic language situation, um, which is, according to Jaffe, uh, a poly polynomic language is defined um, both by its internal variation. Uh, which would be phonological, morphological, and lexical multiplicities, and by speakers' recognitions of linguistic unity and diversity. Uh, Jaffe talks about um, um, uh, at Corsica, so you'll have uh, multiple varieties of Corsican with um, uh, speakers retaining their own linguistic variety with increased comprehension. So that's kind of what I want to see what's going on here, if that was going on here. Uh, so the research instruments, <coughs> uh, uh, so I use a questionnaire survey, uh, interviews and a verbal guise test. Um, each research instrument was perceived as advantageous to the research as a whole. Uh, the large sample size of the uh, questionnaire survey um, would allow for an adequate representation of the TDD, uh, 
There's the, the controlled aspect of the verbal guise test and interviews would provide informants with an opportunity to express their perceptions of uh, Tibetan identity and linguistic uh, circumstances in depth. So um, it's also worth pointing out that a key aspect of the research under investigation uh, was the, um, the collection of data regarding TDD members' perceptions and attitudes as opposed to behaviour. Um, <coughs> so while questionnaires and uh, interviews might be fairly self-explanatory, uh, um, I also want to maybe talk about uh, the verbal guise test very briefly here. So uh, a verbal guise test sought to elicit indirect attitudinal responses uh, to the four linguistic, uh, to the four Tibetic varieties of Andal K, Kam K, Utsang K, and Shijak K. Uh, yeah, so as well as the, the Chukasum uh, varieties, I think I mentioned uh, Sanjos and Shijaks. So Shijak uh, was a uh, diasporic variety, Tibetic variety, um, that my master's research picked up on that uh, members of the TDD were, were self reporting. Um, so the verbal guise test is a variation of a match guise test, which is a sociolinguistic experiment technique first used by Lambert in 1960. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Both tests were used to elicit indirect uh, measurements of language attitudes. Verbal guise tests and match guise tests present informants with a number of voices that they can evaluate, principally in regards to status and solidarity traits. Um, so what they're doing, if you don't know, is um, they want to control all of the variables apart from accent. So they have a, a numerous uh, dialogue, or one dialogue spoken numerous times by, um, if it's a match guise test, one person doing impersonation. And if it's a verbal guise test uh, by, in this case, four different people. So all of the other variables are controlled apart from the accent, and then um, uh, informants can rate their attitudes towards these accents. So um, the accent was seen as, um, the accent variable was seen as uh, an appropriate variable to measure TD members' um, attitudes. Um, and the example I give uh, is to do with Welsh. Um, Boris Giles and Jaffel um, asserts that the Welsh accent, <coughs> excuse me, asserts that the Welsh accent can also serve as a marker of ethnic identity. The mere possession of a Welsh accent was, an, was as effective as eliciting a favourable reaction from Welsh subjects as speaking the language itself. So there you go. Um, right, to look at the, the data tune. Um, right. <coughs> so, right, this is going into my data. Uh, Again, in terms of abbreviations, QS is um, the uh, questionnaire survey and uh, that's uh, the verbal guise tests. Overall, uh, I had uh, 801 uh, informants for this, uh, the questionnaire survey, 56 for the interviews and 156 for the verbal guise tests. Um, so the, the democratic survey of 2009. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <coughs> Excuse me. You can hear me all right, yeah? Cool. <coughs> okay. Right. Okay, so the Democratic Survey 2009 um, uh, stated that 55.6% of the Tibetan population in Dharamsala were male and 44.4% uh, were female. So um, in terms of uh, being representative, the questionnaire uh, data is quite quite good for that, it's quite representative, well it's quite similar to the democrat uh, democratic demographic uh, survey done by the Tibetans. Um, okay, um, according to the uh, democratic, uh, demographic, demographic survey, 59.3% uh, of Tibetan, uh, of the Tibetan diaspora population in 2009 was aged between 10 and 34 years, and so, um, yeah, again, the, the Questionnaire survey maybe is more representative. Uh, the, the means throughout the, so yeah, the means start at about 25 to 32 years. So yeah, the questionnaire being more representative, perhaps. 
Um, okay, and then <coughs> uh, sixty-four point seven percent of the verbal guys informants and eighty-four percent of the interview informants were born in Tibet. So again, uh, looking at the questionnaire uh, data, fifty. Uh, eight fifty-eight point three percent of uh, QS informants said that they were born in Tibet, and then you have a uh, forty-one point seven were born in the diaspora. Excuse me. So, um, I don't know whether to preempt it. So, what I'm looking at in terms of the identity aspects of um, uh, the informants was uh, the saliency of, of the languages, the variety, the Tibetan varieties spoken. And the, uh, the tune, third one gets a prize or something. Uh, the, um, uh, so the, oh yeah. so the, this, the saliency uh, that came from my masters in the, um, uh, the pilot studies were that the Tibetan, uh, Tibetic varieties and identity constructs, uh, the, a salient aspect of those were the place of birth um, uh, things. So, uh, Amdo informants and maybe perhaps previously reported that they speak Amdo and, and so I wanted to further investigate this and also to see what uh, varieties and what identity constructs were spoken in India. So we've talked about Shijak, so we'll see how pronounced that is. So in terms of, um, uh, yeah, I don't know again, these three here, this is probably the most representative and I want to sort of develop that theme and that theme of the language as well. Um, okay, and so uh, I did that by, so this is where they state their place of birth to be, and then I also asked in the questionnaire what their identity was. Um, so these are the, the identity constructs. Um, while the single item case of Tibetan was the largest category, uh, the subsequent five categories for the uh, questionnaire survey data were all multiple items. So 18% of um, informants stated that, that they were uh, Tibetan and Kampa. 13 described themselves as uh, Tibetan and Udzang. 10% described themselves as Tibetan, Udzang and Shijak. 9% Tibetan and Amdol and 5% Tibetan and Shijak. Right. And then um, what I do uh, here and with the, the looking at the linguistic varieties, I present the data overall, but then we'll categorise it by um, uh, the place of birth category. So um, looking at the salient aspects again, there were uh, eight salient identity <coughs> constructs within the Indian category and uh, three for the, uh, the others. Sorry, if I go too quickly say, but I'm trying to rush through it a bit. So there's that. So essentially, it's interesting maybe that uh, Shijak's as prevalent as it is. Um, Shijak and Sanjo's, Sanjo uh, identity constructs can be used in very pejorative terms. So it's interesting that Shijak comes up as much as it does, um, but it isn't the same as uh, how Udzang is reported in uh, the Yudzang category, or Amdo and the Amdo, or Cam in the Cam. Um, okay, did I miss a bit? Yeah, no, that's true. Okay, so um, just looking at the interview data. Uh, the particular aim of the uh, interviews was to report how informants expressed uh, their awareness to identity and cultural identity. The homogenous Tibetan identity construct is central to the circumstances of the members uh, of the TDD. Informant 4 uh, stated that uh, in Tibet he was not aware of the narratives of the uh, Tibetan issue, yet conversely in exile, um, uh, being a Tibetan not only meant coming from a particular ethnic origin, but it was also a, an expression of Tibetanness with the responsibility to exist and remain as such. Um, China was used uh, as a function of other <coughs> in the pan Tibetan identity uh, construct. Uh, this helped accentuate the nationalistic themes. <coughs> Excuse me, Sanjo's. Um, 
from Tibet. Uh, we're not associated with a Chinese identity construct, and uh, for, uh, Shijaks were not associated with that of, a, of an Indian identity construct. Um, the homogenous Tibetan identity did not take precedence over any of the regional Tibetan uh, identity constructs and vice versa. Tibetan membership was reported by informants as to not only have a particular place of birth as a requisite, but was also dependent on the identity of your parents and that of Buddhism. Uh, the fact that uh, they didn't have a home provided uh, also to be a binding factor where moral and cultural rights uh, in the eyes of the informants connected them to Tibet. So uh, uh, one informant gave the example of the association and uh, the influence of, of blood and belonging as opposed to uh, politics and law. Um, the inclusive nature of Tibetanness among the intra-Tibetan groups, Kham, Mandel, etc., allowed the research to surmise uh, both the multiple intra- and pan-Tibetan uh, identity constructs are evidence of yet also sustained in part by the diasporic culture of preservation. Um, Interview informants reported that regional uh, difference is now firmly set within the Tibetan identity construct, uh, creating the concept of otherness and sameness. Uh, this concept allowed uh, Tibetan members to be aware of and express both intra-Tibetan group and pan-Tibetan constructs simultaneously. Um, there were pronounced differences between Sanjas and Shijaks. Uh, Shijaks were um, seen as westernised or having characteristics that came from Western influence. Um, and many informants uh, used children as an example of this. So uh, Sanjo children were seen as uh, suffering as they were removed from uh, their place of birth, maybe uh, disjointed from their families, whereas Shijaks were seen as spoil. Uh, informant 7 said, um, I think... Uh, Tibetans born in India and Tibetans born in Tibet uh, live apart, specifically talking about the relationship within Dharamsala. So it, it can be described as being quite disjointed. Uh, informant 35 uh, described the Sanjo identity construct. They were known for not knowing how to behave. Um, they fought and were often drunk in public and they spat on the bus. So uh, this possibly is a, a, an example of the stigmatization of uh, Sanjo identity. And it still existed to some degree, but <coughs> uh, there was also conflicting information as well. So um, it was now the case that uh, Sanjos were often seen as being um, very good business people, having good business acumen, or being very kind, or um, sort of were assigned status traits, basically. Uh, so Shijaks were also, also roundly criticised by Sanjos. Tibetans in Dharamsala um, also not only have another construct with regards to the, the Chinese uh, element, but also uh, view Indian as a, an, another construct and foreigner or, or Ingshi or Westerner as, as another uh, other construct with which to compare themselves. OK, so aspects of the diaspora. Um, <coughs> Many informants talked about the loss of tradition in their culture in exile and, as a result, the, the loss of Tibetan identity. Informants born in both Tibet and India referred to themselves as being refugees um, and they were able to articulate this sort of uh, multiple, this, this refugee narrative in multiple ways and to contextualise the concept. Uh, the refugee identity uh, was seen very negatively, particularly negatively. However, um, there was evidence in the interviews uh, of a dislocation from Tibet, uh, especially with uh, Shijak uh, informants. Um, I asked uh, several of them if they would um, return. If there, was a if there was a hypothetical situation where uh, Tibet became free the next day, would they return? And uh, many sort of backed off and said, well, they would return, but uh, maybe not so quickly. Um, language was the salient part of how they recognised their identity. Uh, so I've got some quotes here. Uh, one informant said that language was the pillar of our country. Another said, if I don't know Tibetan, then I don't have any value. 
and uh, another informant said, if I'm being Tibetan and I don't speak Tibetan, uh, then there's no use saying I am Tibetan. There's no identity. Language is also being Tibetan. So that's a very salient aspect. Um, this uh, emphasised again, or brought up again, the idea that there was a personal responsibility uh, to aid in the preservation of Tibetan and Tibetan culture. Um, the nationalistic emphasis on, ethnici on ethnicity and Tibetan cultural items enabled uh, the diasporic culture of pres preservation to not uh, only be a heritage culture of reminiscence, but also one which allowed TD members to be active or, or activists, uh, maybe similar to um, uh, a protector of the faith. Um, one, Mr. No. Um, one of the salient features of difference between regional groups, including Shijak, was how people spoke Tibetan. Informants stated that they thought speaking was the only or one of the only differences in terms of identifying intra-Tibetan group relations. Uh, awareness of linguistic divergence um, uh, didn't sign a, a shibboleth, shibboleth function though uh, to create an exclusive form of, of language or communication, it, but it served as a marker of, of identity. Right, so looking at language. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, QS informants were presented with five categories um, in terms of reporting their language. Oh, I've missed, sorry. Hmm, it's the wrong page. QS informants were presented with five different categories in the language section, Tibetan, Hindi, English, Chinese, and other. Please specify. They could uh, choose all or any or, or other which they liked. In total, there were 34 categories uh, that came from the results, three of which were single case items of English, uh, Tibetan, and Ladakhi. And, and there were 31 multiple uh, item cases. In total, 23 linguistic varieties were recorded. And apart from three informants, uh, everybody else said they spoke Tibet, uh, Tibetan. 59% um, said they spoke Hindi, seven, in total, regardless of single repertoires or multiple, multiple repertoires. 70% uh, said they spoke English, and 22% said they spoke Chinese. 80% uh, of informants reported having multiple repertoires uh, with a mean average of uh, 2.6. While the data suggests that having a multiple linguistic repertoire is the norm for the majority of informants, uh, these informants lived in a community where 19.1 of the speakers are self-reported monolingual speakers almost exclusively in the Tibetan language. So, and then this is looking at these linguistic varieties categorised by place of birth again. So in the, Amdal, <coughs> in the Amdal category, there were eight different responses with five linguistic varieties. Uh, in the Cam category, there were 15 with nine linguistic varieties, 12 in the Udsang with seven linguistic varieties, and uh, 20 different categories in the Indian uh, category with 14 uh, linguistic varieties. Um, it's worth drawing your attention to the number of uh, responses uh, given of Tibetan, Hindi, and English in the Indian category, so 67.4% uh, of, of uh, India category informants, Shijak informants, stated that they had this as their linguistic repertoire. So that's very salient. Um, so I'm going to go on. So that was the, the, the linguistic uh, categories. And then I specifically asked about uh, Tibetic uh, variety speaking. So, uh, QS informants were presented with five categories, Utsenke, Kamke, <coughs> Amdalke, Shijakke, and other. Please specify again, they, could, they were instructed that they could answer all or, or more or whatever they liked. Um, so in total, there were 41 category responses, eight of which were single uh, item responses and 33 multiple, um, with 22 uh, Tibetic varieties recorded in this section. Okay, um, so, <coughs> yeah, I don't know what we've done with time. So maybe very quickly, it's worth sort of just, again, uh, in terms of saliency, or whether it's multiple or single, uh, the, uh, I, so the Wiley script, you have to write Udzanke like this, because it's silly 
some reason. Well, so that's Ud Zang. So I didn't see. I should have said this. So that's that's Ud Zang K, and that's Shijak K, and that's Cam K, and that's Amdor K. <laughs> yeah, I I I tried to do my own, and um, Nathan said it was cute. So I think <laughs> I think it, yeah, I just stuck with this. Well, I think he was patronising me. Um, yeah, well, I assume. So um, <coughs> there's a saliency of, of uh, Utsan K and Shijat K, where they're uh, reported in multiple single, singular uh, repertoires. And um, yeah, and then the main uh, uh, single repertoires, you can see uh, Shijak and Utsan again. Um, OK, so all other informants are reported having uh, multiple variety Tibetic variety repertoires, and uh, by far, and large, uh, the largest category was Utsang K and uh, Shijak K. Uh, Tibetic varieties of Utsang K and Shijak K predominantly feature in the large. So these are the salient results again. Predominantly feature in the large multiple Tibetic uh, repertoires, often in conjunction with Kam K, which probably can be explained by the number of uh, Kam informants. Amdu K also featured, but to a lesser degree. So 56% uh, of informants reported having multiple Tibetic varieties, uh, with the mean average being 1.9. So um, while 56.7 report multiple Tibetic varieties, the largest was the, the one Tibetic variety category, and that was 43.3% of informants. Um, so then looking at Tibetan categories by place of birth again, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. The largest response for all of the major place of birth categories is the single case uh, response, which is no surprise. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on. Sorry, I'm going to start going a bit quickly. And this is uh, the Tibetic var variety responses, uh, the salient features of for the Tibetic variety responses within the place of birth categorization. So the place of birth categorization corresponds with the large numbers of Tibetic variety speakers of that category, Amdol speaking, Amdol, etc. Apart from uh, the Udzang category, where it was the first, Udzang uh, K was reported as the second most widely spoken variety, uh, with similar percentages throughout the uh, place of birth categories. Uh, Shijak K uh, also featured strongly throughout the categories. In the Amdo and Kam categories, it was the third largest Tibetic variety, uh, with 53% uh, and 47% uh, uh, respectively. And in the Yudzang category, 51.4% uh, of informants stated that they spoke uh, Shijak K. So the data presented here uh, in this section allows the research to surmise that the majority of informants report themselves as having multiple Tibetic variety, uh, report themselves as being multiple Tibetic variety speakers, often retaining the Tibetic variety most associated with their intra-Tibetan group and acquiring Chukasum and uh, diasporic Tibetan varieties. However, the data suggests that the TDD speech community accommodates mono-Tibetic variety speakers as well as multiple ones. Um, okay, so more interview uh, inf informant information. <coughs> uh, several informants explicitly expressed the notion that they believed only speaking one Tibetic variety was problematic. Uh, the Chukasum multiple Tibetic variety repertoires were reported as having a, a, a three dimensional uh, elements, while the um, Shijak uh, Tibetic variety was not seen as three-dimensional, but uh, one where it's one variety mixed. Uh, when uh, informants from Tibet were asked if they spoke Shijak, uh, a, a typical response was to say, uh, well, yeah, but not exactly. So there was some reluctance to admitting speaking Shijak. Okay? Informant uh, 45 recognised the polynomic uh, Tibetic variety model in the diaspora, uh, stating that he believed for every 10 Tibetans in Dharamsala, maybe eight of them uh, will have different ways of speaking. So uh, Sandra informants, uh, informant responses to labeling a Tibetic variety in their repertoires as Shijak K was diverse. Uh, 
uh, what was often quali qualified as Shijak Ke in one instance was also then labelled as Shijak Ke or Udzang or three province speaking uh, Chugasan. Uh, Shijak Ke consisted of, um, was perceived to, could, was perceived to have be consisted of a dominance of central Tibetan but not Lhasa Ke. So uh, these varieties were often considered to be uh, provincial. Uh, typically it was described as mixed uh, and this refers to not only the mixing of Tibetan varieties but also the mixing of uh, uh, Tibetan with English and Hindi. Many of the informants um, emphasised that there were many different varieties of Shijak K. The status of Shijak K was often reported in contradictory terms uh, by both Shijak and Sanjo informants from anything from normal or local Tibetan to mixed or what they call Ramalu which is maybe neither fish nor fowl, um, to an overtly, uh, overly simplistic language to um, one informant said they, which is Shijak Tibetans, can't speak in Tibetan. Sanjo informants from the Udzang regional group uh, did not perceive the Udzang uh, Tibetic variety they spoke and Shijak as being the same linguistic entity. Um, Utang informants stated that they shared similar experiences to other Sanjo in informants uh, when entering into exile in terms of comprehension abilities uh, of Shijak varieties. Uh, the stigmatisation of Shijak was a defining element of how uh, this Tibetic variety was perceived. Oh, I don't know when to stop. Right, I'm going to... Oh, sorry, I'm lost again. Sorry, I'm a bit conscious about time. Um, right, so uh, maybe I'll go through this bit quite quickly. Um, okay, uh, as well as, so we've previously looked at what uh, informants stated they uh, uh, spoke in terms of uh, linguistic varieties and specifically uh, uh, Tibetan. Uh, Tibetic varieties. So I also asked in the, the questionnaire um, to, for them to report their understanding or, or comprehension. And I think we could maybe you yeah, can do this quite quickly. So, um, for example, 65% uh, uh, of uh, uh, inform questionnaire informants stated that they spoke Udzang, um, whereas uh, there was an increase of 83.1 in terms of what they comprehended. So. That might be too tricky. Okay, so <coughs> really if we just look down this side, and I'm going to show you a couple more tables that are very similar. If you look at the, uh, the Tibetic varieties and then the non-Tibetic varieties, if we look at this, there's, there's sort of huge increases in comprehension, and then, which are fairly consistent, and then the opposite is the case for non-Tibetic varieties. So then I looked at them within uh, the place of birth constructs. So this is the Amdal informant's place of birth construct. <coughs> and you can see, again, you have a similarity in terms of the increases, but not the Amdal K. Um, and then, because, you know, yeah, well, that, yeah, mm. and, uh, and then mirroring the previous uh, table, uh, not the same sort of incremental increases. So then looking at the, the CAM, this is exactly the same, huge increase, but not for the variety associated with their place of birth. And then the same for Hindi, English and Chinese. Uh, the same for Udzang, uh, exactly the same. It's, the responses within each category were the same. And then finally, even in the uh, India place of birth, the responses were, were the same. So, so that's quite interesting. That 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 was so typical and salient in terms of how it was reported. Um, okay. Mm, right, okay, I'm going to do some damage limitation because I want to show you the, uh, the tables for the verbal guise test. Polynomic evidence was reported quite comprehensively. Um, yeah. 
So, so even though it was, maybe it's worth saying, even though it was reported comprehensively, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a given. You weren't assumed that if you had increased comprehension, you could comprehend, comprehend all Tibetic varieties. Uh, uh, informants often reported comprehending uh, specific ones, but not comprehending others. So it wasn't so clear, but it was definitely a feature. Right, so moving on to the verbal guys. Um, so I uh, conducted a verbal guys test and um, I hadn't done one before, so I used uh, two audios. So essentially I did two verbal guys tests in one, maybe, so I could compare the results. Um, there were 15 uh, trait rates that I put into five uh, subcategories. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Um, so if we, okay, if we look at this, this is the cognitive trait uh, rates. So, so there's intelligent, sharp-minded and educated. Uh, just to explain this, okay, so all of this data are statistically uh, significant correlations. So uh, for example, these are uh, the place of birth categories of the informants. So uh, there was a statistically, so L is low and H is high and times two means it was statistically significant in both, both the audios. So for example, CAM informants, there was a statistically, I'm going to say this a million times, there was a statistically significant correlation uh, between CAM informants and low ratings of the AMDL voice in, with the intelligence trait. So, um, again, a salient thing throughout, I'm, I'm going to try and summarise them, a salient thing throughout uh, the results of the verbal guise test were uh, informants, say, f uh, informants from a particular place of birth category uh, rating the voice most associated with that category high. Uh, uh, yeah, so it, it's fairly, in both tables you can see it's fairly consistent. So, yeah. And also I guess the other thing worth mentioning here is uh, how uh, the Shijaks uh, possibly stigmatising the other varieties. I'm going to move on. So that's two of the tables for the traits. Uh, this is another two, so continuing the theme. Maybe I'll come back to them. That's the other one. And then, yeah, I've, I'll try and... Well, I wrote down a, a summary of the results. So just to, to fit all of uh, that information into a sort of paragraph, essentially, um, the data suggests that informants assign cultural value of a, uh, to a particular Tibetic variety uh, they most associated with their place of birth identity construct regarding both solidarity and status traits. Yet they also assign positive traits to other Tibetic varieties. Conversely, informants were uh, also unlikely to stigmatise other... Sorry, informants were also likely to stigmatise other Tibetic varieties, uh, indicating a paradox where Tibetic varieties were assigned both positive and negative traits. Uh, in turn, this is allows for the suggestion that this indicates the concept of otherness and sameness, uh, which interview informants had alluded to. Um, there was a particular emphasis on informants from Tibet stigmatizing she, the Shijat voice in the verbal guise test, um, uh, specifically regarding the traits of uh, trust, affability, and also respect. Okay, and then... Um, I don't know. Very quickly, I'd like to um, just try and summarise the salient uh, results, then I'm done. So I'm nearly done. Um, <coughs> looking at the research questions again. The research produced three salient conclusions specifically associated with the first two research questions. Firstly, the research suggests that informants have multiple Tibetic varieties but also there is evidence to suggest a polynomic language situation exists in the Tibetan Dhamsala diaspora. Secondly, there is evidence to suggest that informants from Tibet and the diaspora acquire and develop multiple uh, Tibetic varieties, which are amalgamations of numerous Tibetic varieties. Um, there were two summary conclusions relating specifically to the third research question regarding identity. Firstly, 
uh, informants expressed strong associations to both regional and pan-Tibetan identity constructs, which allowed for the validation and acceptance of all non-diasporic and diasporic intra-Tibetan group identities, uh, despite examples of stigmatization. But, uh, secondly, uh, the diasporic uh, Shijak identity construct is a salient feature of the TDD, which allows for the concept of an intra-Tibetan identity construct model, which validates uh, this construct as well as the, Chu the Guchu Sum ones. So often it's the case that they talk about uh, Guchu Sum, Sum ones. So, so often it's all uh, uh, the identity constructs are based around Kam, and or Nudzang, whereas I'm trying to say that uh, maybe there's evidence to suggest that there's, uh, you can attach the, the, the diasporic cultural uh, construct to it as well, which hopefully is validating or, or it proves that they are validating it. Uh, two summary conclusions regarding uh, the inquiry into linguistic practices and identity associated with the first three research questions are made. Firstly, Tibetic varieties are markers of intra-Tibetan group identity, which indicates uh, retention of a particular Tibetic variety and the development of a multiple Tibetic variety model, which suggests informants are likely to, ve to develop multiple Tibetic varieties and increased abilities in multiple Tibetic variety competences. Secondly, a shift to a standard variety appears to be overrun by the idea of a, a multiple Tibetic variety model. Uh, data associated with the first research question inquiring into acquiring of uh, linguistic practices was also contextualized with data produced by the third and the fourth research question to produce two summary conclusions. Firstly, a Tibetic variety, firstly uh, as, as Tibetic varieties are integral to intra-Tibetan group identity, the Shijak varieties spoken by Shijak Tibetans are distinct entities. Most notably, the Shijak Tibetan spoken by Shijak speakers differs from the Shijak Tibetan spoken by Tibetans from Tibet, although the awareness of the Shijak identity through the awareness of the uh, uh, Shijak identity construct and the increased usage <coughs> of English and Hindi within the Shijak variety of Shijak. Okay. Secondly, speakers from all four of the major uh, Tibetan varieties uh, present in the TDD assign both prestige and stigmatization of both status and solidarity traits. In particular, the Shijak variety was associated with attainment and education uh, s uh, status traits, yet, was, yet the variety was also stigmatized as impure, which was a uh, data f attitudinal data from the questionnaires, not from the verbal guides about purity. Um, conversely, uh, Sanjo varieties, particularly Amdo and Kam varieties, were assigned high rates of solidarity and stigmatised regarding status traits, yet were also assigned status as pure Tibetic varieties and therefore of value. Finally, um, the last summary conclusion relates to the contextualization of the data produced by the third and the fourth research questions and states that the pan-Tibetic the pan-Tibetan identity constructs and intra-Tibetan uh, identity constructs function in a, uh, um, uh, a mutually beneficial relationship uh, where uh, one, uh, having the identity of one values having the identity of the other and vice versa. And that's me. Okay. Questions? Really? 
what kind of children, what kind of parents would send their kids uh, alone to these spaces? And I asked the principal, uh, most of the children come from south, south and western Tibet, which is more, in his, in his, um, in his interpretation, it is more religious. So my question is, have you looked at the <coughs> religious identity in correlation with the language attitude? Right, yeah. Um, uh, one of the limitations definitely is the emphasis not on looking at the religious aspect. I would argue that uh, you couldn't really different. In my opinion, I would argue that you couldn't really differentiate uh, between one group being more religious than the other in terms of uh, Tibetan identity. Um, it's it was. Uh, I think now because of how many people do come into exile, I think what you're saying. Um, is obviously happening previous to that and what's reported in my research uh, many informants would say the opposite um, that, that the best schools are for uh, um, uh, the Sanjo uh, Tibetans the children coming into exile and, and across the board um, uh, within the, the People's Republic of China I think there's a, a motivation to send your child there to get a Tibetan education um, uh, Chinese education could be viewed very well as well, but um, uh, the religious aspect perhaps that you're talking about I think associates in, uh, from how I see as a, as, a, as, a, as a cultural one as well. I think you're, you're missing out. Um, yeah, definitely. I think it's valid. I think what you, when you said, I, I'd be quite reluctant. I'm not Buddhist or anything like that. Um, I would be quite reluctant to uh, define them as religious extremists in any way whatsoever. I think what you're missing out maybe is an economic aspect. If, if you've got a, a, a relative that's going into exile, you can give them your kid and they'll get free education. Um, whereas in Tibet, um, uh, the part of Tibet I was in, uh, uh, this uh, woman that taught me Tibetan couldn't afford to go to school because she couldn't afford the books. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. So, um, but the education, free education is there in both cases. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, you still have to pay for books. You still have to be somewhere. If 70% if, uh, of them are, are rural, uh, you have to, to live uh, in a non-rural place. Um, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, don't think it's quite the case. Sorry, does that... Is that does, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, we're both right. You mentioned that the Shijak varieties often speak to quite a lot of Hindi and English. Yeah. Language. And I was wondering, or this is not necessarily what you were looking at, but whether you observed maybe a sort of variation in the amount, the level of Hindi and English use, depending on things like subject matter or domain or sort of in block today, anything like uh, that. I, I specifically looked at um, how it was reported as opposed to actual existences. Sure. I, did, I did collect data on actual existent uh, of, of actual examples. Um, no, I didn't really analyse it <laughs> properly enough to know, but um, uh, I think that um, uh, English 
uh, for example, is assigned um, uh, huge amounts of status. So um, you can speak English to be cool, you can speak English to be educated, or whatever. So, so there might be uh, uh, um, spheres of, of, uh, where they, they might, it might be prevalent. Hindi movies are very popular. Um, that, that if you ask most Shi Jack Tibetans what they do of an evening, it's uh, yeah watching Bollywood movies. So so yeah maybe yeah again, but I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I, I have this whole question about when you ask people to self-report on their linguistic skills. Mm. Well, I think How my. Is that a well, because um, <laughs> that's the nature of filling out a questionnaire, perhaps. Yeah. I think if you have a negative what where it. Uh, if you have a. Well, uh, I think you'd have to talk about a uh, questionnaire fatigue or something. I think you'd have to talk about how, you know, not all of the informants <coughs> would be ultra, ultra motivated to to fill out the questionnaire. I don't know what you're like with filling out questionnaires. I get a <laughs> pop-up on The Guardian online to fill out a questionnaire all of the time. Do you, do you ever get that? If you ever, and, and so I often just do it to be nasty and write silly stuff. And even then I get I bored so after... Th <laughs> yeah, but after three questions, you're like, yes. I think the significance is the degree. You, so you might have a negative response to 0.1 or uh, 1 point something. But out of 800 informants, I think that's pretty good going. I wouldn't argue that a questionnaire is some... Um, uh, well, as I said, there's a motivation to do it. And I, I, it's, not, um, it's not something done in a laboratory. Hmm. I, I, yeah. I think what, what you stressed at the beginning was what, that, that, that it was about perceptions rather than about actual, actual behaviour. Yeah, but if you have, like, with the, um, the comprehension, I think you're talking about... So, they're all, where is it? So there's minus four. Um, I, I think that it's fairly similar. I don't think the minus four is any less telling or more telling than having plus two. I think they're all pretty much similar. And then if you look at the comparison between how the larger examples are fairly similar, I think, I think they're indications. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swear blind because it is self-reported i think that what is yeah that is the nature of self-reporting mm. peter maybe i missed it but i'm wondering what language the questionnaire was in and what, and what language was used for the interview right so uh the questionnaire was done in tibetan uh when i did the pilot i uh had both uh english and tibetan but it came apparent that the english wasn't needed or wanted or, or uh, the interviews. Um, well, uh, these these are uh, uh, spoken. Uh, the, essentially, the differences of, uh, we're talking about are to do with spoken varieties. So it was in a, a, a standard. The literary. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, it had. A, a, I don't know. I tried to my Tibetan. Um, especially these days, is not very good. So in terms of uh, constructing, or well, when I constructed the, um, it's not, yeah, it, when I constructed the, the questionnaires, what I did was to, um, I had, uh, I worked at the Gucci Sum Association for a number of years, the, the ex-political prisoners association. So I was involved in the translation from Tibetan to English then. So there's a Tibetan translator there. But um, I gave the questionnaire before I produced them, both for the pilot and the one I used. I gave it to uh, this guy at Gucci Sum and then um, another four or five people. And so it was done by a process of, um, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, committee, as such. And, and yeah, that's, that's not the point I'm trying to explore. It's rather that it was written in a variety which nobody actually speaks. No, it's written, it's written in a, a variety which everybody can read. But nobody speaks, right? So well, I don't... And the, and the Amdo and Carmen and so on are more or less divergent in terms of the... Well, in but terms of the no, the, 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 the written will be the same. So, for example, uh, 
uh, uh, campus. The, the camper, so for example, camper, you'd say a camper, but with the same spelling, you'd describe somebody from Amdor as Amdor Wa. So the Wa and the Pa are, are written identically, but the pronunciation is different. Does that make sense? And, and in terms of the uh, interviews? So in, in terms of the interviews, uh, they were done, again, uh, with uh, translators and ones that could speak English to a, a proficient level without a translator. So um, there were uh, the majority of the interviews were done just with me and in English, some, some 20 so, I can't remember off the top of my head, some 20 so interviews. And then the rest were done with a translator relating to the person from that place of birth. Yeah. Um, you asked uh, what uh, identity construct uh, yeah, the members of the community have. Yeah. Um, would you look at how these identities were constructed in um, the speech practices? So then identifying what they are, but like how they were doing this. So again, um, the, the, the main element was looking at not behaviour but reported awareness. Uh, the legitimacy, the, the, the legitimisation of that was based on the, the saliency of this and the saliency of, of awareness. So um, I did collect some data on, on behaviour but um, it wasn't in my thesis. Um, so this relates back to the, um, uh, the one of the perspectives I took was trying to be accountable and, and, and explaining, being very sort of open about what I was and therefore what the responses might be. Um, uh, if I had been female talking to... Um, a female informant, it might be different. Uh, definitely uh, an outsider is, was the other salient aspect of that. Um, I found that because of, again, because of the, the saliency of, of the responses, the, the subject matter, um, also the fact that they wanted to talk about this, the fact that it was relevant, the fact it was seen as important, and the fact that they had the role of, of being ambassadors of the culture, whatever. They were very open topics. Um, the research didn't come out of, um, so I, I first lived in Dharamsala in uh, uh, 2004 and, and uh, I didn't, I, I was just living and working there and, and these, what came up in this was sort of fairly everyday stuff. I didn't really, um, I've contextualised what they know, what, what or really. I, I spoke English and then uh, Tibetan um, to some degree, uh, for as much as I could. Um, I was told that I spoke. I, <laughs> I was told that I spoke Shijak. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone said I once spoke uh, Uge or Utanke. Uh, the most I could possibly talk about was uh, my connections with Gucci Sum, so I would know the students very well and I'd hang out with the students. And um, uh, initially, if I struggled to, to, to make a point in Tibetan or something, um, 
uh, it was fine or, or whatever. There wasn't there wasn't a big difference between sort of. Uh, prestige or status with speaking one or the other but I didn't really research that so but in my anecdotal evidence it's fine it's a multilingual uh, environment uh, it's a huge tourist hub so they, they, they speak they hear everyone can hear multiple varieties Including English. yeah yeah 